My name is Shaka King. I'm the co-writer, director of Judas and the Black Messiah, and this is the Screenplay Breakdown. Hey guys, how you doing? Hey Shaka, how are you? How are you? Good man, good. Thanks for joining us today. Congratulations on the film, man. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, yeah absolutely. This film is it's my top, it's my favorite film now. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, man, I fell asleep thinking about it. I woke up thinking about it. It really stuck with us. And, and hey, we're, we're, we're really humbled and honored that you would join us today. Uh, no problem. My pleasure, man. My yeah. pleasure. Uh, Shaka, I know you, you chose this scene. We had asked you to pick a scene from Judas and the Black Messiah, which I absolutely love the title. It's epic. Well, you know, yeah, kinda... how did you, sorry, real quick. How did you come up with the title? It's so badass. I actually had in mind first, Jesus was my homeboy. That was the original title. Wow. Uh, and it got vetoed. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we pivoted to a few others. The one I really wanted was 30 Pieces of Silver. I really wow. wanted that one. Because wow. um, it sounded to me like a crime movie, too. Mm. Uh, but that also got passed on. Mm. And so Judas and the Black Messiah was the one that came to me. And I was like, this does feel like a big movie. It mm -hmm. feels like a bigger movie than the other titles we've had. Has that ring you want to watch it, you know, it's striking. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a certain level of showmanship to all of this, you know, all of it. Like it was always intentional to make it a piece of entertainment with, with, with utility. Um, but the entertainment was part of it. And so that title felt entertaining. That felt like a movie I want to go see. Yeah, absolutely. Shaka, so we actually have a scene from Judas and the Black Messiah pulled up here, and we'd love for you to commentate on it, give us some context to it, and run us through exactly what's going on here. Yeah. So um, prior to this scene, you had Daniel, you know, while looking for some cigarettes, stumble upon a journal that Deborah keeps. And he's seen her writing, writing in this earlier, but, you know, the thought behind it was, this guy's been away for a while. Um, he hasn't been in contact with his girlfriend in so long. And he's curious as to what she's been going through. He goes through her, through the book, and he stumbles upon um, this poem that's titled, Are You a Bad Mother or Are You a Bad Motherfucker? You think you're going to be a bad mother? It was a question. Why you got to ask yourself that? I don't, I don't know. Maybe the fact that I'm bringing a child into a war zone. These aren't considerations you have to make. He sees that she's wrestling with a question. They have a conversation about that. Uh, and in the midst of that conversation, he reveals a level of vulnerability to her that he hasn't displayed. So you regret it? What? I have my baby. Do you? For me, when I thought about I my life. Panther women who had children, which many, many women in the Panthers, I just had to imagine, and, and it was later confirmed for me, just that these were concerns that these women had about raising kids within this environment where the state was so oppressive and you could lose your life at any moment. And, you know, yes, I signed up for I signed up for this, but my child hasn't signed signed up for this. Wow! You know, is it am I am I making the right decision yeah. uh, in bringing a child into this world? That's such an intense question to have to consider, mm -hmm. especially when you place yourself in the mindset the mindset of a revolutionary. But I thought it was important to make it clear what kind of sacrifice these people were asked to make, um, because I think it's a testament to their bravery in a lot of ways. You know, we could have done it in a traditional scene. I think that was probably the idea. And then I meet Dominique Fishback, who I, I wrote the movie for. We sit down and she reads the script and she says, you know, I really like it, but I have an issue with the fact that there's no poetry in the film. When I say to Daniel's character, do you write poetry? And, and cl clearly I'm expressing that I'm a poet. When I first laid eyes on all the things you are, I heard that speech and... When an indent pierced your cheek, I knew we'd make noise. I just, I thought it'd be in the streets. And then I was like, oh, wow, like this could be a really cool scene if she conveys this information, you know, and, and, and 
you know, poetic form. Then we can, we can take this other scene that's existed separately and we can artfully cut between the two. And the words that she's saying about her life and her, their situation can apply cinematically to what's happening in this other bit. We educate, we nurture, we feed, and we lobby. Then it was just working with, I, I say working with Dominique, but I didn't work with Dominique. I said, give me a poem about this. And she gave me that poem. And I didn't, all I had to do was cut some stuff out. I mean, the poem lined up perfectly with the action. Wow, wow. Um, wow. I'm getting the into- and, uh, yeah, that's, That just, scene is incredible. Yeah. You wrote this film for Dominique. Did you also write with um, with Daniel and Lakeith in mind? Yes. I wrote with Daniel, Lakeith, Dominique, and Jesse. Wow. That's how insane. Did it, that's how did it awesome. feel that's like amazing. getting them? <laughs> Like yeah, yeah. after writing for them and then they said yes to jump on board. How did that, how was that? I mean, incredibly magical to start <laughs> with. Like I had the three of them attached before we went to the studio. Oh, that's great. I, the three meaning Dominique, Daniel and Lakeith. But the crazy thing is I wanted Jesse. I mean, I wanted Jesse from then, right? This is probably three years prior. I have three years I'm wanting Jesse. And it would try every means getting the script to his agent, his you know, manager and they're saying, yeah, you know, Jesse's not like we 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 got it to him, but he 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 has responded. He's busy giving us the runaround. I'm like, look, who we have all these people attached, still not getting anything. Yeah, you know, we're we're set up a studio, we're funded. Yeah, <laughs> still, still not. What the hell is still going not, on? Still not. Still still can't get a hold of this guy, right? <laughs> and so, meanwhile, because he is he's not responding to us, you know, the studio's like, hey, have we thought about casting like? a movie star, (laughs) you know, like you might be able to get one. And and then we start thinking, well, yeah, I guess the budget would come up then. And then we'd have more money to play with because we'd have to pay a movie star, but we'd also be able to make a bigger movie probably. Mm -hmm. So that idea starts to get floated around. But me, I'm like, I want Jesse still. (laughs) I still want Jesse. Like, (laughs) like, they're like, like, they're like, they're like, yeah, what about this one? I'm like, yo, great actor. Like, (laughs) yeah, it would be cool. But like, Jesse, though, like, <laughs> when, when I see He's this so character, good, how, like, it's Jesse, I'm telling you. Yeah. And, you know, there's none of those, like, big movie stars, that wasn't happening. You know what I mean? So, like, <laughs> reality sets in and they're trying to still, we're, we're still looking at other people, but I'm always wanting Jesse. And so we're in Cleveland two weeks out from the shoot. And I get Jesse's phone number from a, from a member of the crew wow. who worked with him on the shoot prior and he's just like look uh, don't tell anybody i gave this to you but yeah <laughs> and so wow. i call jesse and um i go straight to voicemail and so then i send him a long text just expressing that i've been trying to get a hold of him and like here's the situation and, and he calls me immediately after i press send and he's <laughs> like hey man i never i never heard of this project i didn't know anything about this I'm really sorry. Like, I would have read it. Like, please send it to me right now and wow. I'll read it right now. Wow. <laughs> Come on. And uh, and then, you know, next thing you know, he was he was in Cleveland. And like, it was like, I got my four. I got you the got, four people. Wow. That's incredible. That's, man. That I wrote it for. Two, two yeah. weeks out. Jeez, congrats on that. That's <laughs> no. insane. Jess, crazy. Jesse's insane. What, what's That's so yeah. good. Oh. I mean, what I guess that explains why the film is so great is yeah. because you, you, you wrote these people. Vision. Yeah, you, yeah. You wrote these characters and, and you had the actors in mind and they showed up. Yeah. yeah. I man. mean, yeah. 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 Shaka, that is insane, yeah. man. Did you always have in mind to do a story about Fred Hampton? Was that always the idea? Um, or did you hear about it through someone else? Lucas Brothers brought me the idea. The Lucas Brothers came to me in 2016 and said, we want to make a movie about Fred Hampton and William O'Neill. That's the departed set inside the world of Colin Tupro. And I was like, that's the best pitch I've ever heard. Wow. That's wild. Um, I'm in, wow. you know, and then, uh, and then I, I was in, you know, we sat on it for a year. I don't know why, <laughs> but I remember <laughs> New Year's Eve wow. going into 2017, waking up and being like, gotta make the, this year, we gotta have to make this movie. Call them that day it was like, yo, we are, this year we have to do this, <laughs> and the next day got to work. That's awesome. Reality, awesome. Yeah. Shaka, what? How do you how do you structure a true story? You know, you know, you got the uh, mm. you know the fundamentals of storytelling. You got the inciting incident, whatever the midpoint. But how do you 
How do you structure a, a true life story? Man, listen, man. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a real this this is this has been the biggest education as a screenwriter I think I'll ever have, and I, I bet Will would say would say similar. Just because we've we've written so many different kinds of movies mm. uh, to get here, you know, because we'd done so much research, we wanted to not just. For, I think there was a level of yeah, we want to let you let people know we really did our jobs here, but also wanting to um, shine a light upon some lesser known members of the Illinois chapter mm -hmm. uh, who were powerful forces themselves, and. Um, so the movie was a lot more sprawling and we couldn't get it under, it was, I mean, I think the probably 170 something. I mean, it was just impossible. It was very dense wow. and it wasn't, wow. you know, it, it, it wasn't a studio movie, yeah. uh, right. you know, not a studio movie to 2020, 2021 at least, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we had to pivot and sort of reduce it and kind of lean into the pitch that had been laid forth, which was the part in the world of COINTELPRO, okay, make this more of a two-hander, mm -hmm. you know, how, reduce characters. Um, how do you still keep it, and not, how do you still give it that ensemble nature? Mm -hmm. Well, Fred goes to prison at some point, so maybe that's the time when the other, some of those other characters can kind of be, be elevated. Bunch of cowards! You, you, disgust, come on now. you disgust me! Show some discipline. That Russia gave me a lawyer. What was he arrested for? Don't worry, y'all. I'll be right back. You know, and then there was the challenge of, because, you know, we started from a place, like I said, of wanting to stick so closely to the facts that we had the addresses of locations, actual addresses in the wow. slug line. Wow. That's that specific, crazy. you know, starting yeah. from that to, okay, we're embracing that this is a dramatization and we're cutting characters where we're not going to unfurl the entire conspiracy as to how the Chicago Police Department and the state's attorney's office mm -hmm. got involved. We're not going to make Richard Daly a character. We're not going to make state's attorney Edward Hanrahan a character. We're going to lose that. Mm -hmm. How do we make this leaner still get what, what's important to us to convey? You know, OK, this isn't a this isn't a soup to nuts biopic. This is a movie about ideas and a movie about power and a movie about, you know, two men who have very different ideas of what power and freedom are and how to go about obtaining them. You know, it's a movie about a socialist and a capitalist, mm -hmm. right? And so like, how do we just contrast these ideas uh, in a way where you still have a narrative, you still have, you know, an emotional arc and scope and, and all the things that you expect in a studio film, um, but it doesn't have that structure. Oh, well, we have this interview we can use to play with. Right. That'll sort of make it seem like we have a POV that's a clever POV, O'Neill's POV. But that's just like smoke and mirrors because the truth of the matter is the two of them are never in any scenes alone, you know? Mm -hmm. Not because in all drafts they weren't, right? They, for the first, I don't know how many drafts, we had them as friends, damn near brothers. Wow. And then we met F Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. and tried to get him to come on board uh, just, just really, just to give us his blessing initially. Wow! And he said, y "There are a lot of." He's like, "There, are, there's a number of problems with this film, but the biggest might be the fact that you have these guys as friends." And the truth of the matter is, is that yeah, you might have heard that William O'Neill was Fred Hampton's bodyguard, but that's a lie. Wow. He wasn't. No way. Yeah. Wow. And so he's like, "You want him to speak to his bodyguard?" And he calls him. <laughs> oh, jeez. You know, and he's like, this is real. These are real people. Wow. And we're in, Fred, we're in Fred Hampton's childhood home having wow. this conversation. Wow. So we feel the weight of that. And it's like, OK, we can't put that out there. So how do we go back to the drawing board and restructure this so that wow. the betrayal feels real, but you haven't put forth a movie where you're showing these two guys as friends, you know? A um, lot of gymnastics. I mean, I mean, like, there's so many gymnastics with this film and how you like are deceiving you're, you're, you're fooling people. And look, the fact of the matter is that the structure alienates a lot of people. Mm. You know, there are a lot of like when I do we would read when I read reviews about, you know, the movie's fault flaws. One of the things that comes up a lot is the structure of the movie. I think the really? people who lean into it mm. and the people who are really bothered by it and they don't find it accessible. Um, and that's not because Will and I, you know, don't know how to write traditional format. 
you know, it's it's because bullets come whizzing by you and you got to dodge them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you got to really shift things. You have to be malleable, you know, and I actually think the fact that we pull this off is because we've become better writers Mm -hmm. over the process of making this movie, because we've learned how to make sideways moves and compromises and, and, and manipulate you into thinking that this is more traditional than it is, you know, into thinking that these guys have a friendship, you know, and, 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 and really leaning more so into a movie like heat, Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Where you only see these characters together in a scene by themselves one time. In our, in our movie, no times. That wasn't allowed. Like, Chairman Fred and June was like, that's a non-starter. If you want me and in, in my involvement, they can't be in a room together one-on-one. Wow. They can't be in a car one-on-one, right? Because of the fear that Bill would do something to Fred? Well, they, they just weren't friends in real life. Oh, and okay. that's important to correct that mm-hmm. mistruth that's been printed in many books that Fred Hampton was you know, killed by his bodyguard. It's not true. It, 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 it makes it seem like the Panthers weren't organized mm. and, and would put Chairman Fred Hampton in that kind of position when they would never have done that because they didn't trust Bill O'Neill that much. You know, he still was able, I guess, to get close enough to where he drugged him the night before his assassination, you know, and he was in the space where he, he knew where he lived and he was inside his apartment. He could sketch out a blueprint, but he wasn't his bodyguard and they weren't friends. Shaka, first, as a storyteller like yourself, how how valuable was it to have Fred Hampton Jr. there to help you kind of walk you through really what happened? It's everything. Yeah. It's everything. I mean, it's, it's, it's the experience changed my life, changed everyone's life of getting to know him in the Kuwa Nijiri. And um, it changed the movie to understand that ultimately when Fred said you could kill a revolutionary, but you can't kill a revolution, his son is living proof of that. You can murder a liberator, but you can't murder liberation. You can murder a revolutionary, but you can't murder a revolution. And you can murder a freedom fighter, but you can't murder freedom. I read somebody uh, who talked about the, the epilogue, the, the cars at the end and, and um, how you know, a knock on the movie was that the cards were better than the movie because hmm. the cards were, 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 you know, just you're wrapped. And I was like, no, the cards are the payoff to the movie. Yeah. The mm-hmm. cards don't have the payoff without the movie. Like, you're not expecting, if you don't know the history, that this guy had a son mm. that became, that literally is doing the same thing in the same neighborhood. That's a revel. There's revelations in those cards. And he's you know? the chairman, right? He's, yeah. he's the chairman. Today. And he's Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. And he's chairman of the Black Panther Party Cubs. And there's a reason that that information has been kept from you. Yeah. Because they don't want you to know mm-hmm. that he won. Wow. They want you to go forward thinking that it was a total loss mm-hmm. and the party was crippled forever. And it was brutal and it was incredibly difficult and it was incredibly challenging. But the Illinois chapter remained open for years, as you see in the in the poster. Let me hear the people beat. This is what we call the people beat. Started in 1966 by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. It's the beat that manifests in you, the people. Uh, yeah, we were really, really interested in to wonder, like, how much development as far as character with Lakeith and Daniel did you guys, you know, work on as far as, like, just the way they speak or, like, their mannerisms? I mean, we didn't have much rehearsal time. Yeah. Dale and I got together a year prior. And then, I mean, I think we maybe had like three days to play, four days to play before we started shooting. Mm-hmm. Um, so that stuff was a lot of work that they did independently and finding over the course of making the film and in the moment. And, mm-hmm. you know, they're two of the best actors in the world. <laughs> yeah, so right. Their instincts. Seriously. You, you know, you, you just arm them. Yeah, you, you arm them with the knowledge and the intention that you're going for and uh and then you let them be the greats that they are and you just cherry pick the best shit they give you yeah no i gotta say like dan daniel's uh performance is like the best performance i think i've seen in like in a long time it's astonishing yeah, yeah. It's, astonishing. it's astonishing i was just wondering like when you're writing a character like is it easier for you to to write a character that you're making up or easier to write a character that as already exists like fred hampton it's way easier to write a character you're making up. 
It's way easier to write a character. Because, <laughs> <Way easier. laughs> yeah. like, I was wondering, like, you worry about getting them perfect, right? I mean, it's a it's a gamble. It's the way it's a, the stakes are way higher. Yeah. When it's a, a real life person, <laughs> Daniel will tell you how difficult it was for him to. I mean, and difficult implies that he didn't know if he could do it. He didn't think he could do it. Or that, like, there was no doubt he could do it, mm. but it just required a lot more than um, every other role that he's ever done. <clears throat> Shaka, how did you get your start in the industry? Yeah. So I started making stuff my junior year of college. My friend and, and longtime editor, Kristen Sprague, was a, we were students at Vassar together, best friends. And um, I'd studied, you know, I, I wanted to be a writing major, like fiction major, but they didn't have that at my school. Junior comes around. Chris is a film student. He's um, just getting around to taking production courses. He's had to take theory courses for the first two years. And he's loving it. And he's like, man, I just wish that, you know, I had like a partner that, you know, I was friends with in the class. And so I was like, you know, let me see if I can double major in political science and film since I fulfilled all my poli sci credits already. And, you know, take the theory courses while I take the production courses. And they said yes. And then without them knowing, I dropped the theory courses <laughs> and just took the production courses. Exactly. And by the time they found out, it was it was too late to do anything. Um, you know, started taking screenwriting courses uptown in Harlem taught, uh, at a place called Frederick Douglass Creative Arts Center. One of my classmates was Rada Blank. Shout out to Rada Blank of the 40-year-old version. Um, and um, learned about screenwriting there. Uh, and... Just trying to do it all and just found that um, I didn't have enough time to really become as good as I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to go to film school, just like take out some living loans, kind of gamble on myself. And uh, the plan was to make a feature um, thesis film and take it to Sundance and sell it and be on my way. And uh most of those things happened. I wasn't on my way, though. <laughs> <laughs> Shaka, did you doubt yourself in the process throughout the journey? Like, man, what am I doing? Definitely had doubts. Yeah. Definitely had doubts. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first time, I remember the first time having doubts, I remember my mom called me that morning. And she didn't know that I was having doubts. She didn't know anything I was dealing with. And she called me out of nowhere, seemingly, and said, I was, this is when I was trying to get my movie Newly Weeds made. And she said, you know, so I just went, I'm just call, I'm literally, I'm calling to let you know that, you know, me and your aunt and your father, like, we're going to help you and we're going to make sure you get the, the, this thing made, wow. you know, and we love you. And like, you know, we're going to help you make this thing. And hmm. that call and the timing of it making me believe that it would get made. That was the time I doubted myself. And really the biggest time I doubted myself was after I went to Sundance with Newly Weeds and uh, it sold. For 20, uh, the experience of taking the movie there, first of all, I, I should have known it was going to be a problem when um, I couldn't get a sales agent. I mean, it was like, why are, you, why are we getting any offers for someone to sell our film? Hmm. And this guy called me, the sales agent finally calls me and he goes, listen, I love your movie, but I can't sell your movie. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, you love the movie. It's a, it's, it's very sellable. It's, you know, it's about weed. And this is when <laughs> weed was always being talked about and like legalization was a, a yeah. it being coming nationalized yeah, yeah. was a big issue that year. Right. Took place. Brooklyn was a character in the movie. This is when Brooklyn was the number one real estate market in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like we got a great looking cast. You know, you got some recognizable actors from The Wire. Mm. We can do, you can, you can sell this movie. A, a Magnolia, for example, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, what's, what's that oscilloscope? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like we could, they'll buy it, right? Right, yeah. right. Seriously. <laughs> and he's like, nah. He's like, to be honest, he's like, listen, I'm Asian, so don't take this the wrong way. But you have a bunch of black actors who's no one, no one's heard of, you know, and you're just not going to sell the movie. And I was like, you're fucking crazy. Wow. I'm going to prove you wrong. Go to Sundance, and he was right. You know, that was the experience I had there. Jeez, um, wow. Just no one would buy it. I mean, years later, my friend who works, who worked rather at Magnolia, had a colleague of his who saw the movie say, 
man, why didn't we oh, oh, say like, that was really good. I need, why, why didn't we even look at that? We didn't even watch it. Wow. He didn't even, they didn't even, Magnolia didn't even watch the movie wow. because yeah. they were just like, they saw the cast. They saw it was a bunch of black actors they didn't know. And they were wow. like, no, we can't. That's fucked. We can't, this, we can't use, this is, this is useless to us. And so for me to go, for me to do everything in my mind, everything right. Mm-hmm. And um, come home in debt, you know, mm-hmm. um, was very much, it was rough. It was rough. That was a rough time. And the thing that got me out of that rut was making a, my next short, Moulin Yans. The joy I experienced in making that film, you know, that my that Chris, who introduced me to filmmaking in Vassar, he, he, that was his idea, wow. you know. And, yeah. um, you know, making that with my best friend from high school and my cousin and my friend Sheena Shavers, who's also in Judas, was just like the most fun I'd ever had oh, ever making anything ever, you know. Um, and it came out ex- it came out better than what I envisioned it could be. And the irony is that my plan was to make that movie and just throw it on World Star because yeah. I was over the festival circuit mm-hmm. because I had such a terrible experience with newlyweeds in terms of my expectations. The festival was fun. Sundance was a blast. Mm-hmm. It was one of the highlights of my life. Just like I had so much fun with my cast and crew. There, so much fun. Mm-hmm. But, you know, my expectations for what it would do for me career-wise were, were terrible. And so I wasn't even going to enter Sundance. And a friend said, no, you should you should enter that. And I did. And it got in. And it got me my first TV job. Yeah. Wow. Dude, this is awesome. just That's, the ultimate comeback story. Yeah, the right? ultimate fuck but, you to all those people, yeah, too. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. That, no. Oh, this movie? Oh, big time. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. That, yeah, no, that's what oh, I mean. Just time. like, yeah, big now I got this. Big time. Now I got this, bi- this fucking incredible biopic. This, yeah, seriously. Didn't need you fuckers. Yeah. Just big um, F you to Magnolia, dude. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> all of them, though, because the everybody, everybody passed, man, except for this shitty ass company, Phase Four, that's not in business anymore. <laughs> That was fucking awful. And they lied. I mean, it was terrible. Wow. But you know what's incredible is like you still continue to create. Like, yeah. Mm. That that is the most, that is a testament in itself. Is like to continue. That's what people care about, man. Like, like anyone listening, they're going to hear, they're going to hear your story and be like, that's, I can. That's one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons I share that story with people because Mm -hmm. it was a great, it was a great experience. That, That experience. You know, steel sharp and steel. That doesn't mean I I like to deal with institutional racism on a day to day basis. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I'm I'm a very resilient person. As was as is my dad, my mom, my grandfather, my grandmother, my aunt, my aunt, you know what I mean? Like yeah. black people, you know. Right. Mm-hmm. And and you know, I was reminded of that. You know what I mean? Like I was reminded of the you know that was a traumatic experience. But I was I beat that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it didn't stop me. And it, it not only did that give me confidence, but also I, I had so much fun. It wasn't like I wasn't like, I was like, oh, I'm just having fun. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I love to create. Yeah. That's what's that's what matters at yeah. the end of the day. Like that's what fulfills me. I love to do this shit. It's just fun. Yeah. And that's, that's that's all that should matter, too. It's just fucking. Yeah. Creating. You got to remind yourself to have fun. And it's like. We laughed our asses off at that short, by the way. You guys all playing Italians on the stoop. That was hilarious. Uh, Christian <laughs> showed you, us that you. one. And and you won. You won at Sundance with that. And, and that's that's huge, man. And um, did did that experience make you like a better filmmaker, would you say? Yeah. Yeah. In the sense of it, may, I mean, I was never like, I was never, I, I was always in it for, to just express myself. So there was never like any doubt there, but I think it made me a better filmmaker because Moulinians was a film that we had an idea for, and we, I, we both there was a different ending to it, and we pivoted away, and the ending was so crazy that we pivoted away from it for a year, and it intimidated me. Guys, excuse me, I'm looking for Catadiatu. It's like a Gabonese French bistro. This fucking guy. Fucking guy. It's on top of us. I realize that the only movies I should make are movies that there's a little bit of intimidation, a little bit of can I pull the, can we pull this off? 
it shouldn't be like we can definitely pull this off. Mm. It should be can it should be if the if the answer if the question is can we pull this off, then that's the movie I should make. Mm. And that experience confirmed it for me because I literally sat in it for a year. Same shit we did with me and Lucas brothers did with this one. Sat in it for a year, like I don't know, mm. you know, can we do it? And to me, that's a reason to, to make a movie. Chaga, I gotta ask you, man. What what that's was it like working with two twin brothers? Was that was that valuable? I didn't to even have? think of it. That, I, <laughs> I direct I directed them on it on it. That reason we met is because I directed them in a pilot presentation. So I I like was used to that mm -hmm. you know um, dynamic that they have. Well, you know, um, like Jeff mentioned earlier, we're all brothers. So when whenever we're trying to come up with stuff and create stuff, it's re it, you know makes it really easy to like you know shut something down. Be like, no, that fucking sucks. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> nah, they're respectful. Of, they're, they're very respectful. Too. They don't, they don't, they don't do that. I mean, at least, in, at least not in front of me. Right, right. But they when when, that, when they're know. going at each other, I've, I've never even seen them go at each really? other. I mean, I've only I've seen them I've seen them disagree mm -hmm. on a on a on an idea, but they're like so respectful. They keep another. it pro. Yeah, that, we should take some yeah. notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we're, we're gonna thanks, have to take some notes. Th thanks for that, shot. That's why we gotta get Pat, them on. Pat's got a lot of learning to do. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. um, <laughs> Uh, no, it is. I mean, it gets, it does get crazy and hairy, you know, with ideas and stuff, but, uh, we've gotten better over the years, I will say. Um, uh, but Shaka can, um, I don't want to take too much of your time, but I would just love to know, um, that the, f like first day on set, it's principal photography. Holy shit. We're really doing this. Like you're about to call action. Mm -hmm. What is running through your mind? Let's go. It was just like, let's, <laughs> this is going to be like, let's see. Let's see if we can do this. Like everybody's done the work to prepare. Um, you know, we have assembled as amazing a crew, cast and crew as is possible. Um, are the elements going to be on our side? You know, are the creative spirits going to align? for all of these things to work in tandem with one another at the same time. When they do, you celebrate and you you know, you know, you celebrate internally at least, <laughs> you know, but you, and, but in the moment too, you, you laugh and you just, I mean, I laugh a lot on set, you know, laugh, laughter of, out of being pleasantly surprised mm -hmm. often, especially on this film. And in the instances when they don't align, mm -hmm. you know, think of uh, ways to get what you need um really get to the heart of what you need and get that things move in the right direction and make you just focus on getting that any pushback from like at all like um or or what was some of the challenges like during the filmmaking process like on set like if there was any i mean yeah i mean you know it was i think a challenge that made the films infinitely better mm. was navigating what was really important for Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. to see in the movie and the plan that we put in motion for the script that we'd written, which was, and those two things, he'd read versions of the script, many versions, but seeing it come to life is very different. And, you know, sometimes, I mean, daily, there, there, was, there, was, there were always requests to alter things. Something's really easy to alter, like, like oh yeah, no problem. And other things, super super difficult to change mm -hmm. and it was figuring out if we could change it how to change it and still satisfy what my desires the, the plan that we laid forth um you know the studio's desires etc mm -hmm. uh and those that was challenging every day mm -hmm. but everyone was invested in this coming to fruition and so everyone made sideways moves to accommodate the needs of others from time to time awesome. you know everybody made those concessions that's beautiful awesome uh shaka yeah. what did what did fred hampton say to you after he saw the film it was more like what he was he was i was shocked yeah at how few notes they initially had with more watches they had more notes mm -hmm. um but that first that first screening we had from, I was deathly afraid. Yeah. I think that's the only time I've ever been nervous. No, besides the first time that we flew out to Chicago, that's the only time I think I've ever been like really nervous about the outcome of the movie on the whole. Wow. 
maybe a little bit the first day of shooting. Uh, that was that was a scary day. Yeah, because it's like but, um, it's not like you're telling, or it's not like you're just going to a regular screening, right? You like you're showing someone's life, someone's yeah. life to their son. Like <laughs> the, that's gotta be. And and you know there was stuff in that first cut he watched that that we took out that I think he was showing restraint and not. Like he basically yelling at us about it being in there, but he had the right to. Mm-hmm. And we took it out because even when he just voiced it in a very just like, you know, respectful, gentle way, we were like, you are a thousand percent right. Mm-hmm. And we made that pivot immediately. It was stuff that we thought it was something we actually thought um, when we even watched the cut ourselves. Like, yeah, we got to address this, I think. Yeah. Were there moments like that where you're like even before showing them we're like we can't throw this in like we we put it in we put it in but we knew it wasn't gonna live shaka i guess um just one last question before we let you go man thank you so much again for your time Mm. it's been awesome no problem no problem um what what's next what's next for you what are you working on now um i got a screenplay um i mean it's not a screenplay i have an idea (laughs) kind of tinkering with um very ambitious very, very ambitious. <laughs> not hey, not hey, anything can you, like. Can this. you pull it off? You think it's? Do you think you can do it? That's why I'm. That's exactly why I'm interested in it. That's exactly why. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think that's that's the one I'm thinking of because of that. Because I'm like, this sounds nuts. Wow. <laughs> well, hopefully we, we'll nuts. talk to you uh, when that's out. Yeah, you know? Chaka, we got to get you yeah. once when you know, once it's safe to you know. Get everyone in person again. We'd love to get you yeah. actually in the studio yeah. if you'd ever be open to it, man. It's been yeah, man. great chat. Y'all oh, y'all in Rhode Island? Yeah, we're in Rhode Island. Yes, <laughs> Maybe. Wow. Well, I got to come out to Rhode Island. Yeah, <laughs> yeah man. Yeah, we'll see. Um, <laughs> where, where are you, Shaka? I'm in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Oh, right. nice. Oh, dude, You're still in like, Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah. It's a quick drive. Yeah, yeah, wow. Four-hour drive. Yeah, it's not bad. It's yeah. not <laughs> four <hours. laughs> That's awesome. Well, um, traffic's good. Shaka, uh, thanks for creating this film, man, and sharing this piece of history you. with us. That, you know, I know we all needed it. We got, we had to see it. And, and yeah. you know, thank you so much, and congratulations, yeah. man. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank, right. thank you so much. Thanks, nice Shaka. meeting you. Take care, y'all.